morning. The scripture reading today is in the book of John. It's chapter 17. It's verses 20 to 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. I want to welcome Daniel Charles to the pulpit today. So our message this morning is entitled, What's the Message? It's a little confusing, but I think we'll manage. So my other four section headers started with a C, so I couldn't get up here and start with introduction. So I had to, so let's, let's commence. So imagine for a moment that you're actively involved with an outreach ministry, either directly doing the work or in a supporting role. Imagine further that this ministry is making a difference and people are coming to Christ. In fact, it's so successful that churches are being planted. These new Christians are learning and growing in their faith. And of course, questions arise and different ideas begin to circulate. Representatives are sent back to the parent ministry for guidance and clarity on the issues. There's a big meeting where a consensus is reached and it is decided that a brief message of encouragement should be sent to the new believers. What message would you send? What would it say? I'm sure the first thing you would do is pray, which is what we're going to do now. So bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you once again this morning, thanking you and praising you for the Sabbath that you've given us. We thank you for the uh, uh, opportunity to gather together and to worship you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity I have to deliver this word that you've given to me to your people. I pray, Lord, that that is not me that people hear, but it is you. In Jesus' name, amen. So you may recognize the scenario from Acts chapter 15. But don't go there yet. Let's continue our thought exercise. So put yourself in the situation, involved in ministry, successful ministry, but controversies, questions, possible heresies arise. There's a big meeting, a productive meeting. Consensus is reached. A message is going to be sent. What does it say? What would you write? Would it be about theology, the state of the dead, the pre-advent investigative judgment? end time events, maybe something more focused toward Christian living, the health message, stewardship, being a good neighbor, homeschooling, or the dangers of secular culture, perhaps something rooted in current events and philosophy, politics, or what makes people leave the church and how to keep them, or maybe just a note to say that you're praying for them and to keep at it. There are seemingly countless messages that may need to be sent to any given group of believers at any given time. Have you decided what you would write? If so, I applaud you. You were able to accomplish something that I was not. For my mind, this was an impossible task because there's simply not enough information to answer the question in any meaningful way. I immediately focus on what I don't know. What's the controversy? What was discussed in the meeting? What did the ministry preach to them in the first place? What, if anything, is being preached to them now? So let's turn our focus from the hypothetical to the historical. As we look at the story in Acts, again, that's chapter 15, if you want to turn there in your Bibles, some of our questions will be answered, but some will not. And now we have one more question to answer. What message did they actually send? Okay, so let's read Acts 15. We'll start in verse 1, right at the beginning. And this, uh, we're going to read 1 through 5 to start. This will answer our question about the cause of all this trouble. I don't expect you to be able to read that. I'll read it for you, but here it is. Some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. After Paul and Barnabas had engaged them in serious argument and debate, Paul and Barnabas 
and some, and some others were appointed to go up to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem about this issue. When they had been sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and they brought great joy to all the brothers and sisters. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles, and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So it seems that there's a dispute about circumcision, but really it's more than that. Look more closely at verse 1. According to the custom prescribed by who? Moses. Wasn't circumcision part of the covenant with Abraham? So this is a clue that um, they're probably referring to a principle we find in Exodus 12, 48, which says, uh, Elsie, can you read that for me? If an alien resides among you and wants to observe the Lord's Passover, every male in his household must be circumcised and then he may participate. He'll become like a native of the land but no uncircumcised person may eat it. So there's the key. Once circumcised, he will become like a native of the land or an Israelite. It's describing how a foreigner, a Gentile, can become part of God's people. If you combine that with verse 5 of Acts 15, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And you begin to see that circumcision is being used as an abbreviation or shorthand to say that the Gentile believers have to become Jews first in order to receive the benefits of following Jesus. To further illustrate this, let's look at Galatians 2, 11 through 14. It's probably worth mentioning that I'm not a pastor. I wasn't trained for this, so I'm not really sure of the chronology here. Um, whether, this, whether the story that Paul recounts to us comes before or after what we just read in Acts 15. Uh, but thankfully, for our purposes today, it's not going to matter. Okay, so let's get to it. So here's Galatians 2, 11 through 14. And it says, But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. However... When they came, he withdrew and separated himself, because he feared those from the circumcision party. Then the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, If you, who are a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? find a verse to support this, but the Andrews Bible Commentary explains that Jews saw Gentiles as ceremonially unclean and would avoid social contact with them, which would include eating and fellowship. So when the circumcision party arrived, uh, this, that's this group of Christians who insisted that believers need to keep the law of Moses. So when this group arrived, the Jews among them succumbed to peer pressure and separated themselves from the Gentiles they were supposedly ministering to. Even Peter, even Peter, who had been sent to the Gentiles and had received a vision from God. Do you, do you remember the vision? The vision, it's in Acts 10, 9 through 16. My clicker's not working. Thank you. Um, Right, so a sheet comes down from heaven with all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures and birds. A voice tells him to get up, kill and eat. But Peter refuses because the animals are unclean. The voice speaks a second time, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times. The story continues in verses 17 through 20. Then someone came calling. Men sent by Cornelius, a Gentile who had been instructed by an angel to send for Peter. The Holy Spirit instructed Peter, Behold, three men are looking for you, but get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. God himself sent Peter to a group of Gentiles and told him not to consider them ritually unclean. 
Now, I don't know if Paul was aware of Peter's vision, but he is clear about his thoughts on the matter. So if you weren't convinced by the passage we read previously, Galatians uh, 2, 11 through 14, then verses 3 through 5 of the same chapter should make it plain. But first, we're going to need a little context. So in chapter 1 of Galatians, Paul is defending his apostleship. Right? He explains that what he preaches was revealed to him by Jesus himself and not from the other apostles. He didn't even go to Jerusalem until three years after his conversion, and then he only met Peter and James, the brother of Jesus. So now we get into chapter 2. Then after 14 years, he says, I went up again to Jerusalem. And then verse 2, I went up according to a revelation and presented to them the gospel I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running in vain. Those are very uh, familiar passages, right? So, but now we get to verse 3. But not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. Okay, so 14 to 17 years after Paul's conversion, he finally goes to Jerusalem, led by the Holy Spirit, with the purpose of presenting the gospel that he had been preaching to the leaders of the church. By this time, the church had been established for some time, and Paul had already been preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, so really it's about time they made sure they were on the same page. And after all is said and done, this Greek Gentile does not feel compelled to be circumcised. From this we can infer that none of the other apostles nor the church leaders thought circumcision to be a requirement for believers. So Paul continues, this matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus in order to enslave us. But we did not give up and submit to these people for even a moment so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved for you. Paul is not a fan of the circumcision party. So, so you see, this is the debate. This is the controversy. God has made it clear that the gospel is also for the Gentiles and that they should, be cons they should not be considered unclean or unholy or sinners, right? So, but what are the implications? What are the requirements? Do Gentiles become Jews? Do Jews become Gentiles? Something in between or something entirely new and different? This is what the early church is working through. So let's get back to Acts 15. We're getting to the part about the big meeting often referred to as the Jerusalem Council. This part will answer our question about what was discussed there. So we've read verses 1 through 5 already, so we'll pick it up in verse 6. Elsie, will you read this for me? The apostles and the elders gathered to consider this matter. After they had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you are aware that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the gospel message and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they are. Thank you. So you may have noticed that verse 7 tells us there was much debate. Right? And yet only this one argument from Peter is recorded for us. That fact should tell us that this is the important one. This is the takeaway. We've talked before about the faithfulness of God, how he has done all the work to restore us to himself. He is the one who saves us, who rescues us, who has redeemed us, who has justified us, who is sanctifying us, who will one day glorify us, all as a part of of his ministry to reconcile and reunite with us. The Bible is a revelation of who he is. And so Peter's appeal is also about what God has done. The evidence is that God gave them, uh, sorry, that God gave the Gentiles, so the, God gave the Gentiles the Holy Spirit, just as he had done for the Jewish believers. 
but without them becoming Jews first. Peter concludes that both groups, which include everyone, have had their hearts cleansed by faith and are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it would be inappropriate to place additional requirements on the new believers. The implication and assumption being that the Holy Spirit himself will instruct them. So after Peter makes his statement, Paul and Barnabas testify to what they have seen, what they've seen God do among the Gentiles in order to strengthen Peter's testimony. Uh, verse 12 states, the whole assembly became silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul describe all the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So despite, excuse me, despite Peter's authority as an apostle, the additional witnesses of Barnabas and Paul was important to bring credibility to his testimony in the council of mostly Jewish believers. Remember, we need two witnesses. So then James responds, you may recall from the passage we read in Galatians that those from the circumcision party were described as having come from James. However, as we will see in verse 24 of Acts 15, we're not there yet, but we'll see it soon. Uh, those in the circumcision party acted without authorization, at least in this case. Again, I'm not certain of the order of the two accounts if we've, uh, that we've read, or even if they are two separate events. Um, but the point is that James is a recognized, highly respected leader in the church and is associated with those from the circumcision party, even if we can't determine if he shares their views. He at least has some influence over them. As we read James's response, notice the finality of it. There is no further debate, and they do as he suggests. So here it is, continuing in Acts 15, starting in verse 13. After they stopped speaking, James responded, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon, again, that's Simon Peter, has reported how God first intervened to take from the Gentiles a people for his name. And the words of the prophets agree with this. As it is written, After these things, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. I will rebuild its ruins and set it up again so that the rest of humanity may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, declares the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, in my judgment, we should not cause difficulties for those among the Gentiles who turn to God, but instead we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from blood. For since ancient times, Moses has had those who proclaim him in every city, and every Sabbath day he is read aloud in the synagogues. So James begins by recognizing Peter's testimony and then associates it with a quote from the prophet Amos. James is understanding this to be a messianic prophecy fulfilled by Jesus. So verse 16 is talking about restoring the line of David. The Messiah is called the son of David. So as we apply this to verse 17, we understand that James is saying that Jesus is the way in which the rest of humanity, even all the Gentiles, may seek, uh, may seek the Lord. He recognizes that the ministry to the Gentiles is legitimately from God and is separate and distinct from the way which already existed. That is, joining the Jewish nation through circumcision, as we read previously. For this reason, James takes, uh, excuse me, James takes the stance that we should not cause difficulties or not make it more difficult for the Gentiles to come to God, seemingly agreeing with Peter that the law of Moses has been a yoke that they have been unable to bear. He just wants to send them a short, simple message with some recommendations, which we'll discuss in just a moment. But first, we're going to look again at verse 21. For since ancient times, Moses has had those who proclaim him in every city, and every Sabbath day he is read aloud in the synagogues. What does that mean? All right. So James is pointing out that there are available resources and ample opportunity to hear the law of Moses, should the Spirit lead them to do so. This is also why the letter can be short, because they don't need to rehash or summarize the Torah. They just need to make recommendations that make sense in the Gentile situation. And if I may speculate for a moment, James may also be recognizing that the Gentiles were not brought to God through Judaism, but through Jesus. Now, perhaps I'm projecting a little because, because of our understanding of the sanctuary, right? That 
God reveals his plan of salvation through the sanctuary given to Moses. But we see its fulfillment in Jesus. And like us, the Gentiles have not been won over by the form, but by the fulfillment. Okay, so we've, we've covered what was discussed in the meeting, right? So, so let's get back to this letter. We've learned some things since I asked you what you would write. Now that we know what the dispute was over and what was discussed in the meeting, do you agree with James? Would you write to them about food and fornication or something else? We've read what James suggested. Now let's read the letter itself. Picking up again in verse 22. It says, Then the, the apostles and the elders with the whole church decided to select men who were among them and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, both leading men among the brothers. They wrote, From the apostles and the elders, your brothers, to the brothers and sisters among the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some, without our authorization, remember we mentioned that earlier, uh, some without our authorization went out from us and troubled you with their words and unsettled your hearts, we have unanimous, unanimously decided to select men and send them to you along with our dearly loved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, who will personally report the same things by word of mouth. For, for it was the Holy Spirit's decision and ours not to place further burdens on you beyond these requirements, that you abstain from food offered to idols, from blood, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. You will do well if you keep yourselves from these things. Farewell. So they were sent off and went down to Antioch. And after gathering the, the assembly, they delivered the letter. When they read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. So not only did they send a letter back with Paul and Barnabas, but they also sent two additional witnesses. Again, we see two witnesses to testify to the same things written in the letter. And no doubt, the discussion that led to it. And it must have been what they needed to hear because they rejoiced because of its encouragement, as noted in verse 31. Beyond the greeting and the explanation of the two witnesses, the message itself is short and simple. So much so that I feel like I'm missing something. I mean, that's it. For it was the Holy Spirit's decision and ours not to place any further burdens on you beyond these requirements, that you abstain from food offered to idols, from blood, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. You will do well if you keep yourselves from these things. So let's think this through and see what we're missing. First, they attribute the Holy Spirit with leading them to the, to the, to the decision that was made. That's a difficult claim to prove. The report of the additional witnesses surely played an important role in supporting this statement. But the purpose, I believe, is to be a point of unity, since the Gentiles had also received the Holy Spirit, right? So, so they're starting on common ground. And then comes the news that there will be no further requirements, no circumcision. Now, for me, that alone would be exciting news, especially considering the state of medical knowledge at the time. But for them, Compared to some of the requirements and worship practices of the pagan gods, it probably didn't seem so bad and likely wasn't much of a consideration. Also, they didn't have to become Jews, so no sacrificial system, no pilgrimage holidays, right? So no, no law of Moses. Except for these requirements, these essentials or necessary things, depending on your translation, uh, that you abstain from food offered to idols, from blood, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from sexual immorality, you will do well if you keep yourselves from these things. So, no further requirements, except a few things from Leviticus. Like, uh, that's primarily Leviticus 17 and 18, if you're curious. Um, I was curious about this apparent contradiction. I looked at each individual prohibition to see if there was some deeper spiritual reason for it to be included. And ultimately, trying to mash them together like that, it just, it just felt forced. Um, so especially the one about food offered to idols, since Paul gives a more nuanced explanation in 1 Corinthians 10, 14 through 11, verse 1. In that case, it's not a total prohibition, but an appeal to take the spiritual state of others into consideration. As you'll see, 
that should have been a clue. I also looked at other translations and even, even the meanings of some of the original Greek words. Not that I speak Greek, but I know, I know where to find some tools that help me with those things. So I thought maybe the word requirements should be something less forceful. No, that, that one's good. Remember, we just saw the requirements, essentials, necessary things. That, that's, that one's good. So what about abstain? Aha! This word can be used to mean both to hold back and to have holy or in full. To hold back, to have holy or in full. What? <laughs> Another contradiction? No, actually, it, it means to have one thing by separating from or letting go of another. You can have one thing fully because you've let something else go. So the message to the Gentiles is to let go of your pagan worship practices so that you can be fully in Christ. It wasn't a message about food and fornication or additional rules to follow. It wasn't a call to separate themselves from their family and friends in their community as Jewish custom would require. No, it was a call to unity. Unity in Christ Jesus. Unity that can only be achieved when you have no other gods before him. When you're all in with Jesus. This was Jesus' prayer in our scripture reading in, first, uh, sorry, in John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23 that everyone who believes in him would be one, would be united with one another and with God. What better testimony could there be to prove that Jesus was sent from God and that God loves us than a, than a diverse group of people united for the kingdom of heaven? I'm going to read that again. What better testimony could there be to prove that Jesus was sent from God and that God loves us than a, degree, than a diverse group of people, right? People who don't always get along in, in the world, united for the kingdom of heaven, right? So in, in Jesus' context, he's talking about the disciples, right? Every, they've got fishermen and tax collectors. In, in the, the context of, of Acts that we've been reading, we're talking about Jews and Gentiles, you know, in our context today, you know, we've, it could be black and white or Hispanic. We've got British and American. We've got Italian and Honduran. We've got Haitian and Dominican. We've got Jamaican. We've got a lot of people here among us. And on paper, that doesn't always look like it fits. But in the kingdom of heaven, right? In the kingdom of heaven, it is... Let me read it again. What better testimony could there be to prove that Jesus was sent from God and that God loves us than a diverse group of people united for the kingdom of heaven? Okay, so now we know what message was sent to. So let's wrap this up. We found out what the dispute was about. Circumcision, becoming Jewish, right? We got the, the highlights from the meeting, the testimonies, and the decision for no further requirements of the Gentiles. We read the letter and found a message of unity in Christ. But not all of our questions were answered. Mainly, what was preached to them? We know what it wasn't circumcision, but what was it? If you skim through the book of Acts and the epistles, you'll find a lot of references to the gospel. They preached the gospel, the good news about Jesus. But we don't get a lot of details, just things like, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's from 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. The letters might give us clues, but generally they're follow-up with an already established church. We aren't told what initially won them over. However, that might be intentional. After all, first century Philippi is not 21st century Connecticut. So what is the gospel? What's the gospel? We have four books of the Bible that we call the gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we have the book of Romans, which is probably the most complete record we have of Paul's gospel. But what is it really? What is the gospel really? You might be happy to know that I'm not going to tell you. 
since I've been talking long enough. Instead, we're going to have a series of presentations from different people who may not answer this question directly, but they're going to tell us about the gospel. It's a broad topic, so you can expect to hear diverse perspectives. Everything from the historical Middle Eastern context to testimony of how lives have been changed, to what someone thinks their friend or relative needs to hear, but each one a unique representation of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. With that, let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word, for the lessons that we can learn from history, from those who have gone before us, for, from those who have struggled with the, the issues that, that life throws at us, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the unity that we have in you. Um, and we thank you that our unity testifies that, that Jesus is your son, that you sent him here, that all of this and what we do and how we worship you, it's because, of, because there's power in it, Lord. Lord, we, we pray that you help us to, to let the things of life go. Let things go so that we can hold on to you and have you more fully. So that we can ultimately represent you to the others so that they too might want to have more of you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.